SUVs reached an important milestone in 2017, becoming more popular than passenger cars in Australia. That's clearly the case in compact models, where baby SUVs like these are outselling their city car cousins. Not bad when you consider that they really haven't been around for very long. The Toyota CHR romped home in its first comparison test for drive, beating a range of rivals. But now it faces new competition from an all-new Subaru XV and updated versions of the most popular cars in this class, Mitsubishi's ASX and the Mazda CX-3. The Mitsubishi ASX has enjoyed enduring popularity in Australia despite being the oldest car here. On sale since 2010, the ASX has benefited from a range of updates over the years, including a cosmetic facelift with a couple of interior tweaks for 2017. As one of the bigger cars here, we've tested the ASX in entry-level LS auto form, with an official price of $27,000 plus on-road costs. But you can forget that number, because this car is available drive away in August 2017 for just under 26 grand. Value is a strong point for the Mitsubishi, which is the only car in the group to offer a five-year warranty. The ASX is also the only car here with 18-inch wheels, but it misses out on stuff like sat-nav and the latest active driver aids. When you jump into the Mitsubishi ASX, it really does feel dated. Its entertainment and information systems are behind the curve compared to its competitors. While it's not the most advanced model here, the ASX has more room in the boot than any of its rivals, and there's plenty of space in the front and rear for occupants, which also have excellent visibility through its large windows. The ASX is powered by a two-litre four-cylinder engine that drives the front wheels through a continuously variable automatic transmission. Its 110 kilowatt and 197 newton metre outputs squeak past the Mazda and Subaru to make it the most powerful car here, just. But it's also the least efficient, using 6.7 litres per hundred of unleaded. Though it's dated to look at, the Mitsubishi really feels its age when you hit the road. Take it out onto a country road with a few bumps like we have today and yeah, you just feel the age of the car. It doesn't feel anywhere near as refined or sophisticated as some of its rivals. I mean, when you get into a corner that has a few bumps, like the one we're about to do now, you can just, oh God, you hear that through the car. It's just rattle, 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 bang, bang, bang. The refinement in this is just really ordinary and the body control of the car too. When you get it pitching from one corner to the next, you can feel the car just get up and wallow on the suspension. It doesn't feel planted on the road. It doesn't feel directly connected. It doesn't really transmit through the steering wheel what you want to feel through the car. And you get very little information as to what's going on at the front end and how much grip you've got to play with. And to be honest, it's just really disappointing. The ASX is noticeably noisier than its rivals as well. Out on the road, it's, there's a real constant boom and roar through the car. You certainly do hear what's going on with the road surfaces. You know, you hit little undulations and things and it just echoes throughout the cabin. It feels like a car with 150,000 kilometers on the clock, even though this one only has about four and a half. Hopefully Mitsubishi has a replacement waiting for this car in the wings because the ASX really is starting to show its age. Honestly, I'm a little puzzled as to why it's proving so popular in Australia. I know Mitsubishi do them quite cheaply, but it's a huge letdown. Toyota surprised us with the CHR, a car that goes against the grain with concept car styling and a tiny turbocharged engine. We reckon it looks great. Though it's not cheap at $28,990 plus on road costs, you do get plenty of gear for your money, including a comprehensive active safety suite that the other cars here just can't match. Though Toyota's three-year 100,000 kilometer warranty is stingy, it is the cheapest car here to service by a significant margin. The CHR offers the most interesting cabin to spend time in. It's got a beautifully designed dashboard and quirky details such as these diamond-shaped scallops in the roof and doors. The Toyota offers a decent amount of room for occupants in the front and rear, particularly for a car of this size, but visibility is quite compromised by its coupe-like silhouette. The CHR is quite well specified. It's the only car here with dual-zone climate control, which is great to have, but it's really let down by this infotainment system that feels very aftermarket and dated. And it's also got only one USB point in the car and it sits there hanging out the front of the dashboard all the time. It's very awkward and it really spoils the look of the interior. The CHR's 1.2 litre engine is easily the smallest one here and it's the least powerful with just 85 kilowatts on offer. The Toyota's 185 newton metre torque output is also modest in this company, but it feels okay thanks to a turbocharger that provides a decent amount of torque early in the rev range. Like the ASX, the CHR drives the front wheels through a CVT automatic transmission, using less fuel than everything but the Mazda. The Toyota CHR is built on a new platform, and you really do feel that as you're driving around. It's the quietest car in this group. It offers excellent refinement, partially down to that turbocharged engine that really does its work in the background. You never really hear it working too hard at all. 
The CHR is a light car and that helps it have the smoothest ride in this group. It is really well sorted. You do hear the odd noise from the suspension, but you don't really feel it through the seat and through the steering wheel the way that you might do in the other models. In terms of steering, the Toyota points very nicely. It communicates well with the driver what's going on underneath it, and it just responds quite well to driver inputs. Three out of the four cars here have a continuously variable transmission or a CVT, and the Toyota is definitely the best in that regard. A lot of cars with CVTs, you drive them and you really notice the way that they flare and don't really offer a direct connection to the engine, and you can hear some interesting whining noises and things like that going on. There's none of that in the Toyota. It's really well sorted, and it does an excellent fuss-free job of driving along. You just stick it in drive and forget that you have any kind of interesting transmission in the car. It just works. The CHR really took us by surprise when we first drove it. It continues to impress. Mazda is on a roll with SUVs offering up a family of excellent models including the CX-5 and CX-9 that are among the best in their class. The CX-3 is no different, blending excellent value, safety and road manners that should have it on every small SUV buyer's shopping list. Mazda updated the CX-3 in 2017, adding autonomous emergency braking as standard while tweaking its dynamics. We've tested it in two-wheel drive max form that makes it the cheapest car here, priced from just under 25 grand plus on-road costs. You get plenty of good stuff, including front and rear autonomous emergency braking and a 7-inch touchscreen, but it's more expensive to service than the Toyota or Mitsubishi. The CX-3 offers a driver-focused cabin with this lovely leather-lined steering wheel augmented by twin digital displays either side of the speedometer. There's a central tablet-style display that you access via a rotary controller here, a little bit like a luxury car. It's a very modern cabin, but it doesn't offer a lot in the way of storage, and as the smallest car here, there's really not a lot of room for occupants. The compact CX-3 is the most efficient model here, using just 6.1 litres per 100 kilometres. Mazda's 2.0-litre motor makes 109 kilowatts and 192 newton metres, driving the front wheels through a six-speed automatic transmission, the only conventional auto here. So out on the road in the CX-3, you notice that old Mazda bugbear of road noise immediately. It does feel considerably boomier in the car than the Toyota particularly. There's a fair bit of uh, harshness going on here. You tuck into a corner and hit a bump mid-corner, you can feel the steering wheel rattle and shake in your hands, which definitely isn't the case in the Toyota or the Subaru, which is a little disappointing. Road noise has been a real problem at Mazda's for a little while, and it looks like it still is for a little while to come. The CX-9, the massive SUV, is really impressive, but a lot of other cars in its range are blighted by excessive road noise, and that's certainly the case in the CX-3. The CX-3 also has a little engine that works pretty hard in this circumstance, and when it kicks down through the transmission, it can really hear it make a bit of racket. It certainly works a lot harder audibly than the CHR's little turbo motor does. A little bit of torque steer through the steering wheel as well in the CX-3. It's funny, the interior would suggest that this is the most driver-oriented car here, but when you take it out on the road, it is a little disappointing. I have to say that I was expecting more from the CX-3, particularly with some of the model year update changes that it's had, but it really doesn't deliver on what Mazda promises. It does feel a size smaller and just a little less resolved, less mature on the road, without the kind of composure that you want from a new car. Subaru has a lot of form with compact all-wheel drive models, and the original XUV was well ahead of the curve. It's back with an all-new model based on the Impreza hatch. The Subaru is the only car here with all-wheel drive and an automatic transmission as standard, though the entry-level model tested here misses out on the EyeSight safety suite at 28 grand plus on-road costs. The XV is the biggest car here, filling a size larger than the compact CX-3 and CHR. And of course, you can have it with plenty of active safety features, but you do have to pay. Subaru has really lifted its game for in-car and interiors, and the XV is the best we've seen from the brand in quite a while. It's got three digital displays throughout the cabin, plenty of room for occupants, and the XV is also the only car here with Apple CarPlay, an absolute game changer for in-car entertainment. The XV is powered by a 2-litre four-cylinder engine that produces 110 kilowatts and 196 newton metres, driving all four wheels through a CVT automatic transmission. It's not a great combination, with high fuel use and a lethargic feel on the road. We've also experienced the odd hiccup from its CVT auto, which feels quite average in stop-start traffic. The XV really does drive like a Subaru, which means that there's a real weightiness to its controls. The brakes and the steering have a bit of a bit of a heavy feel to them that kind of can reassure you and help you feel like you're driving something a bit solid. The XV is a bit noisier than I hoped it would be. Subaru say they went to quite some lengths to improve its road noise, but they don't really 
feel the fruit of that. It does seem noisy in comparison to some of these cars, particularly the Toyota. The XV definitely does give you confidence as a driver. When you tuck into a corner, you can really feel what the car is doing and it really does communicate with you what the tires are up to and how much grip is available. And there certainly is a lot of grip. Uh, definitely does feel like a car that's really hunkered down, tied in well to the road. There's not a lot of body roll at all. It feels like something that you can really depend on. The real issue I have driving the XV is its transmission. It just doesn't feel the way that it should. You can hear a noticeable whine when you're driving along the road and you can you make a change to the throttle, you can hear. It's almost like tinnitus. It's this real, uh, real high-pitched faint whine and scream that you can hear in the background that really is quite unpleasant to me. And then we've had some issues with the car driving around in day-to-day -day traffic where it feels almost as though the tires are egg-shaped where you, you get a, a movement through the car from time to time that seems to be attached to the transmission. We've had it in three examples of this car and I uh, have to say it's pretty disappointing. All four of these cars do something really well, whether it's space, value, practicality or safety. But only one car gets it just right and that's the Toyota CHR. This is a closely fought category, but the CHR's blend of safety, tech, and low running costs make it the pick for this bunch. Toyota is clearly onto a winner here.